I'd like to introduce to everybody uh, our special guest this evening. Um, I'm going to start with a, little, a short story which uh, a few of you heard when I introduced him to the workshop <coughs> yesterday. Um, I've been following Tom's blog on rapid e-learning uh, for uh, 2008, so five odd years now. Um, I have had hundreds of tips that have saved me literally thousands of hours of work. Uh, and every, every, every time the blog comes out, there's something new and useful in there. Um, I really, really wanted to meet him. So a couple of years ago, when I was involved with the Chicagoland chapter, I helped push forward for, for to getting Tom to come to our chapter to <coughs> present a workshop, a couple of workshops. And we got it, we, we, we agreed it last year in, uh, in January and it came in November. Uh, those of you who know me will know that uh, between January and November, uh, I moved to San Francisco. So I didn't get a chance to actually attend that session. Oh. <laughs> so this year when I became VP of Programs at this chapter, um, I knew I needed to get in here. So I created the whole summer of e-learning <laughs> so that we could have <laughs> Now the truth is <laughs> I created the whole summer of e-learning so that we could have Tom here uh, to present to you. Tom is the v VP of Community for Articulate and uh, one of the original e-learning heroes, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Corbin. Thank you. Um, like I said yesterday, it's all downhill <laughs> after that intro. Uh, make sure it's our coffee. Uh, soda. Yeah. All right, let me, let me switch over here to my slide, and we'll talk a little about e-learning. All right. You put on my young people's glasses. <laughs> Okay, so Um, I should probably shut the door so that I can already hear it. It's going to be okay if I shut the door? No. I don't want to disturb all the people with the laughter we're going to have. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the power of rapid e-learning. How many people, and it's not an articulate spiel, so how many people do e-learning development right now? Okay, so what do you, how, who's been doing it for, let's say, who's been doing it for like one to three years? Okay, just kind of getting started. Who's been doing it for at least five years? Who's been doing it for 10 years? 20 years? Anybody? So uh, how long have you, when did you start with, like, what, what were you using when you started? Oh, no. oh. Yeah, it was an online tool that somebody had, that a client had. I, I can't even remember what it was right now. EPAT. Okay. It's called EPAT. Okay. EPAT. Yeah. So the, um, you know, when I got started, I'll give you kind of a little background on me. I was doing marketing work, and then I decided that, well, you know, I wanted to change directions. We didn't have kids, so I said, well, now's a good time to go back to school because. When you have kids, all of a sudden life changes and all that. <laughs> so I, um, I uh, decided I was going to go to this media program. I was going to be some MTV music video director or something. I don't know what my, <laughs> my thought was. I, can't, I remember telling my wife about how I was going to be famous or whatever, right? So the, uh, so the thing was, I went to this media program, and then uh, apparently they only hire talented people. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to look for a different type of career. Um, actually what worked out well for me. And one of the challenges, kind of similar to some of the challenges people run into in the e-learning industry, um, especially those kind of getting in today with some of the graphic offering tools. The challenge I had back then was 
I was coming out of the program. I was actually in the middle of the industry was changing from analog video to digital. Uh, nobody owned any, any like even something simple like Movie Maker would have been like a fifteen thousand dollar program. So coming out as a student uh, and then going into this industry and the whole industry, you know, most people were freelancers, and so you're competing against people who've been doing this stuff for a long time. They had a lot of skills, and it was kind of hard. Uh, to get in there, and um, and the cost to get into doing that on your own and kind of maybe undercutting some of the freelancers was a bit challenging because everything was expensive. Uh, it's similar to e-learning today is you have a lot of people who have the capability with technology, a lot of freelancers that we know, <coughs> excuse me, I need to get some water here, a lot of freelancers, but the challenge is You've got the capability in terms of the easy production, but you've got to go out and compete against people who've been doing it for a long time. One of the nice things, though, is a lot of the quality of e-learning hasn't changed over the years. So even if you have the experience, you can still get in a lot easier than probably uh, maybe a few years ago with the, um, the tools. So when I started, you know, I, I got this job at this healthcare group. And I kind of was their media department. And then uh, they initially hired me to do some basic stuff. And then I kind of proved my value there to work extra and all this stuff. So they kind of created this position. And I worked for the education group. And, uh, and then e-learning was just starting to kind of do. I remember back then we, um, we got our first email accounts. And our CEO sent emails to us telling us, you can only use this for business work. You cannot use this email. You can't do anything outside the company with the email, which is today's world just doesn't even make sense, right? <laughs> and so, um, so we were just getting started. The networks were just starting to develop, and you know, e the internet was kind of becoming something you could actually use, right? Back then, the web pages were gray. You know, some of you may remember all that. Um, but then, you know, that, at that point, e-learning, when we started doing, was mostly web. So it's mostly like HTML. So the first course I built, we actually used Navigator, used to have like an HTML authoring element to it. So I actually built our first e-learning course with Navigator, which was the browser back then. And it had a way to do that. And then, you know, we went to Authorware, which was kind of a cumbersome tool. Except for Michael. Michael Allen doesn't think it's cumbersome because he created it. But everybody else who's used it thinks it's cumbersome, right? And then fortunately, Flash came along, so we were actually transitioning our development from, from authorware to Flash. Because years ago, when you did e-learning, and you delivered a course, and if it was an authorware, which was kind of the de facto tool for most organizations, you then had to send that you know, 500 megabyte file to the player. So you'd send this course login, but they had to download this massive player, and nothing ever worked. And, and it was just a hassle. You always, dealing with calls. And then uh, Flash came out, and then everybody kind of shifted to Flash. And what made Flash, and it's still today the case, what makes Flash great is the Flash player, almost everybody has it. So when you do something in Flash, it works the way it's supposed to work for the most part. You know, today the challenge is we're going to HTML5, and when you work with HTML5, you don't know what's going to work because you don't know what browser people are using. So you don't have like a single player that everything can run into. Uh, so what was interesting is years ago when you did course development, like when I was building e-learning courses, you had a graphics person, you had your instructional designer, you had your content expert, might have had a media person, you had an IT support, a programmer, and then you had this team of people, you build a course. It took a while, you know, so that build even something really simple took, um, you know, 90 days. It, it just took a while. It always took like six, seven months to get a decent product out the door. And it's because you had so many people and all these other things. So that's kind of where rapid e-learning came in. When you, when you think of uh, the history of rapid e-learning, these tools have come in and it's taken a lot of that requirement to develop, you know, away from people and it's made it a lot easier. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, here's some contact info, like my email address. You can email me if you have questions. Doesn't have to be e-learning if you're thinking about buying a car or something. <laughs> probably 
got some opinions on that. <laughs> uh, and then my Twitter account. If you're not a Seahawks fan, don't bother following me. I'm just saying yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> Any 49er fans? Of course. All right. Isn't it nice that the NFC West finally has a good division, right? They're not the laughing stock of the NFL. It's like the best division in the NFL. Uh, and then, if you're not a blog subscriber, there's the address to the blog. Um, for those who don't know the blog, I write about e-learning. Um, I try to keep the tips real simple and practical. I kind of, my target audience is people just getting started. And I don't write necessarily about Articulate, even though I work for the company. So the tips are pretty generic. So if you're using other tools, you probably find some value from that. All right, so we'll talk a little about the evolution of e-learning, which I touched on. You know, a lot of people think e-learning started back in the mid-90s or so, you know, in terms of like the modern era of e-learning. It actually went back a ways, right? So it started with the invention of the light bulb. And um, notice Edison had a candle because he didn't have a light bulb that inspires ideas. Okay. So then from the light bulb, they would do the shadow puppets, right? So you get your first part place, hostile workplace environment, you know, the training there. Um, and then, you know, that, yesterday I kind of touched on that. This is kind of, you know, and it's funny because I have people who will email me and they'll say, hey Tom, where's the rapid part of rapid e-learning? Right? And that's a good question, right? Because if you started 20 years ago, this is what you had. You had a whole bunch of people working together to build a course and you know, all this technology, you know, it was, just, it was just a hassle to build a course, get it out the door. And you know what's funny was, there was an article, it was probably in the mid-90s or so, the, some CLO was writing in Training Magazine, he said, you know, what's the problem with training? You know, if I ask the training team to build training, it takes them forever to get something out the door. And yet, every day, newspapers can crank out all sorts of content, right? In even news magazines like Newsweek, you know, they, and they're product, produced content that they can create all this content. Yet, if you ask the training team to create the same thing, it's going to take forever to do that. And it's kind of interesting because it's the same thing today. Why is this e-learning stuff taking so long? Because every day news magazines can crank out these interactive multimedia pieces. So you go to USA Today or any of the news mag uh, newspaper sites. They've got all these really cool multimedia pieces built around the day's news. So the news organizations, multimedia journalism, very similar to e-learning, but they're always kind of a step ahead in cranking out content. But years ago, this is kind of what it took to build a course. You had all these people who worked in there. You had your instructional designers, your SMEs. There's always that person who threw a wrench in things, right? The, the manager or um, whoever. A kind of a bonus tip, if you do e-learning, the person who throws the wrench in the system is that person who's going to review your course after it's done, but who's not involved in it, <laughs> right? So find out who that person is and get them involved at the beginning, because this, this always happens. You build a course, it's ready to go. The person says, hey, this is great. Wait until I show my manager. You show the manager, all of a sudden you get all these edits, right? They were never involved in the process. Um, we actually ran it. Dave and I ran into that. We were doing something for Lingos. Uh, we did like a volunteer project. And uh, we wanted to, uh, I showed the videos, the, the course uh, yesterday. But um, we, all we got was Word documents. And it was on this communication technology. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make the course a little bit more interesting than just the technology. So we thought, well, let's go to the website. They'll have these success stories. We'll tie their success stories and videos and these case studies. It's all there public. We're going to tie that into their course, and it kind of ties the mission of what they're doing to their learning, right? So it's kind of neat. So we put that in there. The second we put that in there, the marketing, we were done. The marketing person, who nobody knew, uh, came up and said, well, you can't, you can't do that. Oh, wait, is this being videotaped? <laughs> uh, don't, don't share this in England. No, but, um, but the marketing person kind of came into the picture and said, hey, you can't do this because, you know, these are all these marketing videos and you don't have permission. 
It's like, well, wait a second. Wait, how do we, what do you mean we don't have permission? It's all on your website, right? It's your content. Uh, but the thing was, this person wasn't involved in the process. Kind of came and tried to throw a wrench in at the last second. But we, we dealt with it because I said, well, how much are you paying for us to do this? And then they weren't paying us anything, so we kind of went with what we were going to do. <laughs> so if they're not paying you, then do what you want to do. And that's a bonus tip. But anyway, this is how e-learning was done a few years ago. So it was, a, it was a little bit more involved. And this is why rapid e-learning kind of took off, because uh, today kind of became this. You had like one person. So all these people kind of were drilled down to one person. And I read a blog post a few years ago, and this um, blog writer was responding to the mainstream media. The mainstream media, you know, the newspapers, they've been losing money like crazy, and they were complaining to their shareholders, and the thing was, well, the problem is all these bloggers appeared, and they just fragmented the market. So now, instead of this nice market where we could sell our newspapers, these bloggers came, and they created this fragmented market, and now people can go wherever and get their news and do what they want to do, right? And uh, blog writers said, well, no, the problem was there was already a fragmented market. The problem was there were only like three groups serving that market. So they weren't taking care of all these little needs. And the bloggers came around, and they were able to do these little niche areas, right? Same thing with e-learning. You have all these, the biggest complainers about e-learning, Anybody here an e-learning vendor? Not an articulate, like not a software company. Right. Well, you're not a real e-learning vendor, but not, not in that sense. But you're, you're, you're an e-learning vendor, but not in the sense I'm thinking of. But the of content tool. Or, or like somebody who designs courses and, and all that stuff. So the biggest complainers of rapid authoring are the ones who build e-learning courses. Because what's happened to them, they're like the mainstream media companies, and they've said, you know, we're losing money because all these rapid e-learning tools and the people using rapid e-learning tools have fragmented the market, right? So now we can't make money. So what they do is they've gone out and then they trash all rapid development and all that. They tell you, oh, the sky is falling, you know, we're in the dark ages where everything's falling apart because people have rapid e-learning tools. But the reality is I think the tools have democratized e-learning. So what's happened is it's given tools to anybody who wants to build or share their expertise. Now, it doesn't mean every single course built is great. But guess what? 20 years ago, every course that was built wasn't great. 10 years ago, every course built wasn't great. 10 years from now, every course that's built is not going to be great. It does not matter what tools made. It's based on what the organization is committed uh, to spend money on and, and how they want to do their development. Yes? Don't you think it's the process that's the problem and not the tool? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. I think there, it, I would say in terms of if, if there are issues in e-learning, I don't know if there always are, but if there are issues in e-learning, it's probably more a result of the organization's commitment to supporting the what they're doing for training. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, um, the, uh, so some of the things that you get with the, with the e-learning here is, you get some cost and time benefit, although like the person who emails, like where's the rapid part? But if you started 20 years ago, you could really see it because it took a long time to build courses. Now it's an, anybody could work with the tools, right? So if you, if you do have the skills, you could do a lot of stuff yourself. Um, if you're just getting started today, then nothing's rapid because you're, you're not starting with that background. But the rapid e-learning tools have decreased the time requirements to build some training. They've decreased some of the cost to build them. I was at a conference and um, talking to a group. They came by the booth and they were looking at what you could do with the tools. And they're going, well, I didn't know it was that easy. And then they said, we're paying like $15,000 a course. And then you know they showed me the course. And it was basically the person was using like a rapid authoring approach. Not, not a tool, but they had their own kind of form approach. They were charging $15,000, which really weren't much more than glorified PowerPoint slides with nice pictures on them. And they were doing that. And then they were sitting there thinking, well, wait a second. We can get like six licenses, and we're, we're the ones creating all the content anyway. 
we could crank out the same quality of content we were getting from this vendor a, a, a lot cheaper, right? So they were allowed to save money. The last company I worked at, I would price out the courses that some of the, the groups would go with. They would never, we had a big e-learning group. A lot of them would never hire us internally because we worked for the company, so they had to go spend money. So sometime, one time the ethics group of all groups, right? And they went out and spent $300,000 for an e-learning course. And it was pretty basic, it was just big. And we could have done that for, for probably like $50,000. Uh, and then there were other groups, because they were the trendy part of the company, they would go hire flash companies to build the courses. They were cranking them out at about $30,000 a pop. And they were still pretty basic courses. They had a little bit in terms of interactivity, but they weren't, you know, great courses, not for the money they were spending. So I used to always price those out, and then I would say, look, we could build the same quality, but we're building these things for like fifteen hundred dollars, and you know. So the time savings, the cost savings, kind of made it easy for organizations. The tools are easier to use. I think the thing that's neat that a lot of people in the industry who complain about this. Uh, miss is it's really that access to everyone has created a lot of opportunity. So two examples. I know a dentist who um, he uses um, Engage. We have like a simple form-based tool, so you can you just drop your content and hit publish. So he'll shoot some video. So he has these kind of goofy. Um, he calls them e-learning modules. I just they're like little multimedia information pieces. But he shoots video, he has these goofy things on taking care of your teeth, he's got it on his website, and then if the kids go there, they get like little um, wooden coins when they go into his thing, and then they could cash them in for candy or something, right? Because he wants to keep them coming back. <laughs> <laughs> but he gives them something, Molly Pops. Um, but then he also has like a little kiosk, so when they're in the thing, and he's really good, I mean, he's a funny guy, so the videos work well for him. But you know, here's a guy, he would never have hired a Flash developer. So all of a sudden, the fact that this tool's available to him, like there's a market that would never, they were the fragmented market, they would never have used the Flash resources to do that. But now that this tool was there, and he knows, oh, I could just shoot this in, uh, with my, my flip cam or whatever iPhone. I can drop the video in there. I can build it the way I want to. It's only going to take me you know, a little bit of time to do that. And it, and it, and it meets my needs. That's great. Another good example, a friend of mine, he's a um, uh, service manager for a Honda, dealers Honda dealership. And what they did is they started getting the um, mechanics to videotape the basic things like brake jobs and stuff like that. Because, you know, whenever you go to a car dealership and you get your car worked on, you always feel like you're getting ripped off, right? Because you don't know, especially if you're not a car person, right? So you don't know if you're they're telling you, yeah, well, you know, normally this would only be $199, but your wingity ding, you know, is rusty, so we have to change that or rotate it and now. That's going to be $500. And then, you, so you're talking to your spouse, well, it would have been cheaper, but you wouldn't take care of the car now. We've got to replace the wingity ding. Right? So the thing is, these, um, you always feel like you're getting ripped off. So he thought, well, we're not ripping people off. We want them to feel like we're partners in, in, in their car maintenance. Right, so they started to do these videos, and then since he knew me, and I did e-learning. I just got to show him. So he's using Engage as well. But they shot vid the mechanics shot videos. They're not the world's best videos, but they shot videos. They're nice, clean, clear videos, and show what a brake job is. They explain what they're doing. They've got them on a website. They've also got them at a kiosk. So when they're in the waiting room. So then what happens is they found is people look at these videos of these basic car repairs, and then they kind of feel educated. And then because they're educated, they feel empowered, and they don't feel like they're getting ripped off. They feel like, oh, I understand now what the organization's doing. Now, we would call that an e-learning course or an information type thing. But the thing is, again, it's another example of how instead of shutting things down, the market's kind of fractured, but the fracturing's really exposed other opportunities. Because that dentist might say, you know what, I want to build higher quality courses. Maybe I want to build something interactive. So Engage isn't going to give me the level of interactivity. I can't do the interactivity. I understand the value of what I've done. Now I'm going to go out and look for an e-learning person to build 
maybe some drag and drop interactions or more of a game, right? So now I'm going to require that expertise. The Honda dealership, maybe Honda comes down and says, hey, we really like what you're doing. We're going to spend a lot of money and we're going to build something a little bit more sophisticated. And that creates opportunities then for e-learning developers, you know, to, to do something more sophisticated. So the fact that it's become democratized, even though there are some issues which we'll look at, it really does create a lot of opportunity in the industry. So if you're an e-learning developer, rapid e-learning is not the end all to everything, but it does create a lot of opportunity. And it's a great opportunity for people who want to come into the industry that in the years, years ago, this is what I found. I kind of became the e-learning person by default because Every group, I did not work with a man or um, another guy in, a, in any company I worked with until I worked at Articulate, or we had our Flash developers at the last company I worked at. Training, every training group I worked at was almost all women, well, all women except for me. And what's interesting, I think, is I became the person, everybody wanted the technology stuff. Like, we don't want to mess with e-learning, because it was always programming stuff, right? We don't want to do that. And the training people, I think we're more drawn to the facilitation and the relational kind of the connecting stuff. And so what I found over the years is on the technology side, the development of e-learning, it was almost all men. I go to workshops today, it's probably about 60% women, 40% men. 60% women, 40% men, yeah, something like that. We go to England, though, England is about 50-50. But usually it's, you know, Probably in a workshop, 75, 60% women. So I think that's kind of an, another interesting trend that what might have been seen as a barrier to getting to the industry isn't a barrier because now you're not having to become a programmer, which may not have been an interesting part of the field, right? Now you can take your training skills and more of the soft skills, relational type <coughs> skills, and you can bring that to the industry. So I've seen it's an interesting uh, shift in the industry. Um, but there are, there are some issues, right? And this is probably one of them. The person who builds a course has to do everything. So who, who's building e-learning courses right now? So do you do, I mean, are you doing everything? Do you do on graphics work and, and all of that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Kind of? Okay, well, so if you do, okay, so if you're working, who works for an organization that's building e-learning? So like, so let's say, you know, there's contractors, you have a contractor, freelancer, Right? That's one type of person that you're working for a company, you're hired to be the instructional designer, you're not a contractor. So who's, who's in that part of the field? Like I work for the company. And now, of those, who gets access to graphic designers? Uh, that's usually what I find. We usually find it's about, when we do a workshop, it's about 5% of the people. In a bigger city, you might have a little bit more, but it's usually about 5% of the people have access to graphic designers. I was speaking to this big pharmaceutical group on the East Coast. They had a um, state-of-the-art training facility, one of the nicest training facilities I've ever been in. Just, it was just all training, this beautiful facility. Um, they probably had live, they probably had 60, 70 people live, and they probably had double that online. You know, to, and they were all learning the Articulate software, so there's a big commitment to to this e-learning team and all that. So we're talking <coughs> to pharmaceutical companies, they always have money, right? <laughs> they ever go to a training, a pharmaceutical training conference? It's always in the five-star hotel. But the, um, when I talked about assets and images and all that stuff, here they had all this money in this building, <coughs> you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars committed to, right, millions of dollars committed in payroll, hundreds of thousands of dollars committed to, you know, the software and technology and stuff. And yet when it came to getting like a $20 worth of images to build a course, none of them got that. Fortunately, their director was sitting there. So as soon as I asked that question, they all like shook their head and they're all looking. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. <laughs> but that's the reality, whether it's small company, big company, right? You tend to be the one who has to do everything and you're wearing all those hats. And all of a sudden, there's this pressure on you. You've got to be the instructional designer. You've got to be the technology person. HTML5 is coming out. Now all of a sudden you've got to be some HTML5 expert. You've got to understand how mobile devices work and 
why browsers work or don't work and how the memory works on iPads and, and all this type of stuff where in the past you didn't have to worry about that. You just, you were the instructional designer, somebody else did all the technology stuff. Today, you've got to deal with all that because your company went out and bought you a tool that makes it easy to build the courses. And now you've got all these other things you've got to do as well. So that's, that is kind of the challenge. So you've got, years ago, you had to have a bunch of people and it was hard to get courses done. Today, the software has made it easy to get the courses done. It's also put a lot of pressure on that one person who has to do the course design. And generally what I find is people who have gotten into e-learning, most of them didn't just come into e-learning out of school. They were good at explaining things, so they became trainers. They've been doing classroom training and all that. And then the company says, well, we need to cut costs, so we're going to start doing e-learning. Now you're an e-learning developer. <laughs> and it's like, wait a second, I was just getting a handle on all this training stuff, and now I've got to learn all this e-learning stuff on top of that. So it really does put a lot of pressure. That's really one of the challenges of, of the tool. So we've got that. The other challenge is rapid doesn't mean better courses. I worked at, I can talk about Washington Mutual because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> they actually went bankrupt right after I left, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you turned it out the door. Yeah. No, the, uh, when I was at Washington Mutual, we were using back then a uh, Macromedia Breeze. It's kind of like the PowerPoint and Flash tool, <laughs> server based. So one of our executives got his hands on it. And what happened was, probably like every other day you'd come in, there was a mandatory course. <laughs> because what he did was, he would, instead of doing memos, oh, no. he started building everything as e-learning courses because he knew he could track them. But then he knew who was and wasn't reading his memos. So that's a good example of the bad, the, the bad power of rapid e-learning. Right? But because you can develop this stuff rapidly doesn't mean that what you build is good. So that's not the same, right? Rapid e-learning, you've got the capabilities, it doesn't replace sound and structural design. So you still have to make that commitment to that. Now when you get to that point, building it's going to be a lot faster, but you still have to make the commitment to, to building something that's good. So some of the talent challenges, we kind of touched on some of those. Um, the technology is getting easier. You know that one of the things um, that I've noticed, like when, you know, say five years ago, and I obviously I worked for Articulate, so we were doing the PowerPoint to Flash stuff. You know, five years ago, if you were coming into e-learning, the PowerPoint to Flash was kind of the easy entry point into the industry. You didn't have to learn Flash, PowerPoint. If you get away from the PowerPoint presentation issues, PowerPoint's a very effective tool. You've got some nice authoring capabilities. You could do your own illustrations in there. I mean, it's a it's a really good tool, and then essentially you could build your animations, build everything in PowerPoint. Whatever you build, good or bad, um, can pub publish to Flash, and you're essentially just building Flash movies out of your slide. So your slide becomes a Flash movie. Today, the you know the tools have evolved. So you've got you know other tools on the market. You've got you know on the articulate side, Storyline. So. Um, the technology is getting easier to build. One of my favorite things in Storyline is that you could do a drag and drop interaction in about 30 seconds. So what I think is neat, as we talked about earlier today for those who are in the session, a few years ago, I'm not a programmer, if I wanted to build a drag and drop interaction, if I wanted to do something in my course that had any type of sophisticated interaction, say with variables or drag and drops, whatever, I have to go to the programmer if you had a good programmer, the good programmer would say, hey, that's a really cool idea. You know, I've been playing around with some ideas. Let's see what we can do. Here's what you typically get, because they don't want to work with you, right? Because they're busy and they've got other things. So it's like, well, it's a good idea, but, you know, I don't know. I was reading a study about interactivity, and that type of interactivity is not going to add any value. It's going to impact the cognitive load. So we've got to make sure we're not impacting them in a negative way. You know, they're going to be shaking at their computers because you, you messed up their brains. <laughs> or you know, they'll say, well, you know, we could do that, but unfortunately our network doesn't support it. Right? Is that what you, I used to hear that all the time. And I used to always say, well, why do we have a network? 
If we have a network, we should be pushing as much as we can out on the network to stress it so they build a better network, right? <laughs> not, we can't do it, let's not use it, right? <laughs> um, so the, so you, you get that, right? But today, I can do a drag and drop in 30 seconds in Storyline. So now I can say, you know what? I can do a drag and drop. I'm not worried about technology. Six, seven, eight years ago, you would go to e-learning conferences and they were all talking about technology. Today, because the tools are getting easier, the conversation's about instructional design. Now there are a lot of bad courses, but today they're talking about the bad courses from the instructional perspective. A few years ago, it was all about the technology. But now all of a sudden, I can build an e-learning course, I can build a drag and drop, I don't now need to worry about how to do it, now I just need to go, why do I need to do it? If I want to have a drag and drop following certain types of interactivity, I can start to think about why I'd want to do those things and whether or not they make sense in the course. And in the past, that, that wasn't the case. So I think that's one of the things. So you've got the technologies getting better, the choices, the, the roadblocks are kind of disappearing. The problem, though, is the instructional design. So the organizations, what I, what I tend to find, and I do workshops all over the country, uh, is that organizations really aren't as committed to the instructional, instructional design as they can be. And so that's, I think, the big opportunity, especially for you know chapters like this with ASTD, the big opportunity is like, how do we help people become better instructional designers? Because the reality is most organizations aren't committing the resources to help people be better at the instructional designs. Now part of that, we'll look at that with the courses and stuff. Part of that is because of the types of courses that get built or why they get built. But you know that's probably the big thing is the instructional design needs to be intentional and it's not just about getting content, pushing content out. So there's the big opportunity in the industry. And um, uh, the other, I don't know why I put that on there, that's actually a bonus, but um, <laughs> One of the nice things with the authoring tools is you can begin to uh, pre-develop some instructional models. So you might have a person who's not a good instructional designer, but you can develop some templated instructional models that work like pre-built scenarios where they can swap them out. They, they work to a point, but you know the technology allows you to do that and it kind of helps speed it up. But ultimately the organizations need to make a commitment uh, to the instructional design. That's kind of where, you know, on the Articulate side with the community, you know, I look at our community, I've got three, three main parts. So one is we've got the uh, customer support in the sense that you bought the tools, you have some technical issues, we want to help you get your technical issues solved. <clears throat> but the bigger part that we focus on is you bought our tools, you need to build a course, but you don't know how to really build a course yet. So we're committed to helping you build a course. You just happen to be using our tools. That's different than just the technical help. Because what we recognize is we've got people buying the tools because they're relatively easy to use, but they don't really always know how to use the tools or they don't know how to build courses. So that's where we're committed to that. And you know, if you're an Articulate customer, anybody use the Articulate tools? So you know, have you gone to the community and used the community? All the time. All, the time. All right, cool. Thank you for the backgrounds and the yeah. <laughs> So we try to, as much as we can, we try to help and we're really, I mean, that's why we do this. I was telling Alan um, earlier today, this isn't part of my job, the coming and doing workshops. I actually just like doing it. Well, actually the history of that is I was doing the big conferences you know, the big conferences, they don't want the vendors there. They just want the vendor money. They don't want the vendors there. Right? And then when you're there, they don't want you talking about your products. Which is kind of backwards because if I was a manager, I'm spending thousands of dollars to send my people to a conference. They happen to be using, maybe they're using Captivate or using Storyline or whatever. I want them to learn how to use that tool. So I'm spending a lot of money to go to a conference. I want them with the vendors, I want them to learn how to use the tools. So you go to the big conferences, they never want the vendors talking about their tools, right? So then I thought, well, this is nonsense. You know, you're sitting there, I've got all these people coming by the booth asking questions. I'm gonna start doing these workshops. Some of the chapters, you know, or different people will contact me about doing these. But I just do these because it helps me stay connected to people doing the courses. So on the Articulate side of the community, 
you know, as much as we can, we're committed to help people become better instructional designers and think through uh, what they're building. And, you know, it's a slow process for a lot of people because, you know, you're doing other things, you're swamped with time, you know, when your company knows the tools are rapid, that means they want it done rapidly, right? So you've got a week to build a course and, and that's what you get and you get the resources they give you, which usually isn't a lot, so you've got to make do with what you have. So um, here's a question. So I got this asked of me in a panel discussion once. So is rapid e-learning the reason there are so many click and read courses? So what do you think about that? So you're in the industry, you take, you take courses, right? Is rapid e-learning the reason there's so many e-learning, so, so many click and read or bad e-learning courses? Yes. Is it? Yeah. 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 Because, because it used to take a lot of effort to create a bad course. <laughs> <laughs> now it's easy. And if all, and it, as you said, is it, if, if, so, if you've got like the, the CEO who knows his way around PowerPoint right. and decides to start turning everything into a, a course, he could you know, take it, import it into you know, a rapidly learning tool, generate a course, Hand it to somebody. Put it. It could be in the LMS. Or he, he can even publish it to the LMS himself. <coughs> and then the follow, when they log on, they can have that to do the following right. day. It's easy to do. You don't need any instructional design knowledge. You don't need any thought about it. You can just do it. I'm going to disagree. <laughs> so Trisha disagrees. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking back to I don't want to give my age, but college pre e-learning and those courses if we replace the computer with the instructor those are click and read I think um, they existed well before the, the click and read moved online okay so you just had bad instruction overall it just happens and now we've digitized it yeah. <laughs> it's more visible it's more visible I think it's probably a matter of both right you said more Right. And that's yeah. right. Well, I think you know you have a few things. So one is I would agree with Alan in the sense that you've got easy access to the tools, so somebody could just crank content out like crazy, right? And then I think you know Trisha's right. There's always been bad training, and it's just now it's just bad training that's online, right? Um, I've always found like when we've worked in training groups. And you'd go out, you'd, we, you know, like one of the companies I worked with, we had every training person was like a performance consultant. We had different senior level managers we worked with. And it was funny because when that whole performance consulting thing came out, was that, what was that about like late 90s? Was that the big thing, performance consulting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when that came out, all the training people were, for, were performance consultants. So they would all consult themselves out of work. Mm -hmm. Because once they started analyzing the courses or the training requirements, because it wasn't necessarily always e-learning, they would say, well, this is, there's no training need here. Now, what we found, um, this is a matter of self-preservation, too. Sometimes you've got to deviate from what the training people think they should do. But the, uh, what, we, what I found was the senior managers, the training people would talk themselves out of doing the work. Because they, you know, they were right. They'd look at it and say, There's, this isn't a training issue. A training's not going to solve this problem. The senior managers, well, that's cool. Thanks. They'd go out and hire somebody to build training. Or <laughs> they'd have underlings do the training. And then the underlings, they would say, well, we're not going to work with those training people. They don't know what they're doing. Right? So I would go, like, they're in the one place in the production environment. You go down there. They had all this training going on. It just wasn't documented, but they had, I got one guy who's a print, this is a, at a remittance processing facility. Like a print guy running the, the printer machine was doing all their, what they called e-learning, which everything was done in PowerPoint. And it was pretty sophisticated. I mean, he like drew the print machine with PowerPoint in there. It was, it was, it's amazing. I don't know how long it took him to do that. The point was the training was being done. It wasn't great training. It was just all informal. Nothing was being captured and stuff. But training was happening on the floor and under me. So the training's there. I think though they kind of have a combination of things, right? The tools have made it easy to create it and capture it. 
uh, but the training's always kind of been, or there's always been bad training. I think the other thing too is, at least in, in the U.S., the um, with all the regulations and all that stuff, that drives and lawsuits. That drives the majority of e-learning. And in that world, it's not always about performance improvements. It's really just about let's get the content out there. We don't care if the content's good. We just want to make sure if we're in a court of law, we can say. We provided training. I don't know why the guy was sexually harassing people. <laughs> right? He took, then he's, look at these PowerPoints. <laughs> he should have been sleeping. What was he doing harassing people? Uh, so the thing is, you know, I kind of threw these up there. So here's why I think there's some bad training. One is, you know, I referenced Michael Allen's book because he wrote that I think 2004, 2005. That's before all the rapid e-learning stuff. And he was referencing all the bad e-learning. And he's been doing this stuff since, what, the late 60s, early 70s. Um, so he's seen his share of bad e-learning. And that all existed before the rapid authoring tools. I think one of the problems is the monkey see, monkey do thing, right? So people build the courses that they're used to seeing. So if they see a lot of click and read courses, then that's what they build. And that's what they think training is. As a matter of fact, we talked about that the first day. Um, I've had clients where you talk to them and you want to build something interactive, and they'll go, yeah, yeah, we want to do that too, but we still want the e-learning. So they think e-learning needs to be this linear click and read stuff, and all the other stuff is extra stuff to kind of embellish the e-learning. The real e-learning is the click and read content and, <laughs> and all of that. And so they, they, people tend to build what they see being built. So when you have people you have a training team, they're building kind of simple linear click and read courses. You bring on a new person, if they're not skilled, like you know, everybody that's kind of coming in the industry, then what are they going to build? They're going to build what other people are building because that's what's acceptable in the organization. The other thing is limited resources. You're going to build based on the resources you have. Yeah, I'd like to build the most interactive course in the world. I don't have any time, I don't have any money, so I'm going to build what I can build with the resources I have. Um, organizations get what they want to put their money into. They know, you know, if, if there wasn't compliance training, and, and there's some compliance training that actually meets real performance needs, but if they didn't have that kind of that compliance regulatory training, if you took all of that out of e-learning, my guess is like 80% of the people in the industry wouldn't be in e-learning <laughs> because there would be no e-learning industry. So that really drives it. And because of that, the organizations are going to spend what they think is appropriate. If they said, if we could do this training, and we know we would increase sales by 50%, they would commit whatever they needed to do to get that increase in sales. But if they said, we could have 100,000 people click this next button, log it at the LMS at the end of you know, December, and it's only going to cost us $10,000 to do that, they're going to spend $10,000. They're not going to go out and say, you know what? We need to make these more dynamic because they're going to commit the resources they want to commit to the type of training they do. And then the other thing is there's a lot of training, and it kind of goes in like in the blended world. There's a lot of training that's part of, there's a lot of training that's part of the, um, just facilitated content that's part of other Training like universities are pretty good examples. Anybody here work for a university? So I find you know when I've worked with the, with some of the people, some of our customers, you know their interactivity is happening outside that course. The students are doing research papers. They're having online discussions. They're doing other things. So in that sense, the lectures and those things that's just part of the documentation for the total learning experience. The learning's not happening just online. So in that world, you know, the, what we would say is click and read or see as a negative, a lot of places say, well, this is, we're just digitizing content that used to be in paper, now we're just digitizing it, and now everybody has access to it whenever they want to have access to it. Is it the world's best e-learning? No, but it's, it's exactly what they need to support the other things that they do. I read a book um, my slides changed on me because I clicked on my wrong on the wrong slide deck. It should actually be a straight line. Um, but the um, just want to get your attention. Let's look up. 
No, so I was reading this. Anybody read this book, Trade Off? David, good job. Uh, you made me read it. Yeah. Trade Off, the guy who wrote the book, it's about companies and how they um, put their products on the market. And he said, generally, when people buy products, it's either about high fidelity, right? So they're willing to pay more for the fidelity, or they want convenience, and they're willing to pay, they're going to pay less for the convenience, and they're willing to make trade-offs. So anytime you make a buying decision, there's a trade-off in the process, right? And so he says, when you're positioning your products, what you should be thinking of is, is it a high fidelity product, or is it a high convenience product? And then where's the trade-off in there? So you know, the example he gave, this was back when you could only get the iPhone, it was like $500 or whatever, right? And then people were standing in line, they'd get the iPhone, they'd all walk around. They might not even have phone service, but they're walking around their iPhones, like everybody know, I've got the iPhone, I've got it here, the iPhone, right? Um, they weren't buying it back then, now you can get it at Walmart, right? But they weren't buying it back then because they needed a phone. It was a, it was a conversation piece, right? It was, a, it was a sign of, hey, I have the iPhone, you don't, right? So <laughs> exclusive, it's the fidelity. If they wanted a phone, they could have gone to Target and bought one of those pay-as-you-go phones for you know, $20, and it would meet the needs of the phone. At that point, the trade-off is, I'm not getting a fancy smartphone. Nobody's going to invite me over to show off my T-Mobile pay-as-you-go phone. But I'm getting the convenience, right? Only pay $20. Got the convenience of the simple phone. The signal. On the other and a signal, right? <laughs> On the other side, the person with the iPhone, the phone wasn't the phone calling wasn't what drew them, right? It's the fact that you it was a prestigious thing, right? I have the iPhone, could do some cool stuff, let me show you what I've got. And so you're paying more for the fidelity. Same thing with music. You can go buy a CD or MP3s for a few dollars and you get the music, it's convenient. You go to a U2 concert and pay $200 or $300 for a ticket, you're not going there because of the music, you're going there because of the experience, right? It's the music playing that can make it sound as good as what you can get on CD. So you're paying more for fidelity. So there's that trade-off. So same thing in e-learning when you think of rapid e-learning. On one end, you have custom programming, right, which gives you the fidelity. It's going to cost you a lot more, but it's all custom. You can do whatever you want to do. It's going to cost you more, more time. On the other side, in the e-learning world, not even just you know rapidly, but on the other side, you have form-based authoring. It takes you about five minutes to build something because the software does everything for you. And so you make a trade-off. I'm building courses. Am I going to go with at one end? the world's best custom built e-learning. It's going to cost me $200,000 to do that. Or am I going to go to the other end, I'll buy a simple tool, copy and paste stuff, drop it in there, hit publish, and I'm done. So you've got this kind of range of products. So you've got the fidelity, you've got the convenience, and then you've got to think about where does what we do fit in into that range. So you've got you know the cost, time, uh, speed of business, right? Because sometimes the companies, they don't want to wait 90 days or six months for a course. They want a course right then and there. So you've got to, you know, you're making a trade-off. Okay, we can get the course out there. We're going to use a form-based tool. It's, you know, we can get it out to you in a few days, but you're not going to get all the interactivity and all that stuff. You give us time, you give us money, we're going to do a higher fidelity experience. You're going to get a, a better program course, maybe a better learning experience. Really just depends on that. But that's a great book if you've never read the book. Um, this is how I used to learn about <coughs> e-learning courses. It always was like one to five, right? And then the implication was, well, five's always better than one, eleven's better than five. So uh, if you had an e-learning course, and you said, well, that was a level one course. I was at, I won't mention the vendor's name, but I was at a, this was before the economy tanked. So I was at a conference and one of these e-learning vendors, one of the big ones, they came by the booth and she said, um, do you know anybody who does this rapid e-learning stuff? And I said, yeah, I mean, what, are, what are your needs? She said, well, 
we got all these customers that want to do the rapid learning. We can't get any of our developers to do this. So she was trying to pawn off, you know, I can imagine thousands of dollars of work because they couldn't get any of their people to touch that type of work, right? But a few months later, the economy tanked. But then she was saying, well, we don't want to do them because they're all level one courses, right? Because we've kind of created this thing, level one, information-based, it's not valuable. It's only valuable if it's five, it's interactive and all that. So if you look at like a lot of the descriptions of training, you know, having the, the, the number association, all that's not bad, but what, what it's done is it's made one seem less than five. It's really not that because it's, if you go back to like the trade-off, that kind of line, it's really one and five, and they both meet different types of needs. And so which is the best course for the need that you have, right? So I kind of like to think of it more like this. I'm still kind of thinking through this, but if you kind of think of it, I can spend a lot of money, I can spend no money, right? So I've got a lot of resources, I've got no resources. A lot of time, no time. So I've kind of got that. And then I don't see those information-based courses as negatives or the click and read courses as negatives. I kind of see it like you've got two types of courses. So you've got performance-based courses where you take this course and the course is about you changing a person's performance or their behavior. And then on the other side, I just kind of call it the multimedia performance support. So some people say, well, if it's not about performance support, we should take all that content out. We should create PDFs. Those should be job aids. But I don't, I, don't, I don't buy that because I think the time it takes for me to build a PDF, I can just as easily build like an engage interaction. Same information, and I can deliver it in a number of ways, right? Because it could, it could be a PDF, but I could also make a little multimedia interaction. Now we call it e-learning, but to me that's like a multimedia performance support. It's information that supports the performance requirements in the organization. They're going to need that information somewhere in the process, right? It just happens to be done with the multimedia tool rather than as a work. So it's like, well, I can make this boring Word document. That's going to take me an hour. Or I can take that same hour and I can build a cool little interactive module. Same content. I can put the interactive module online. And maybe the fact that it's interactive and they can explore, they're more apt to use that. Or I can create a Word document. Same thing. Right, it's going to support the performance. We call it e-learning. It's probably not e-learning, but it's part of the performance support process. So I kind of like to look at it that way. I'm building courses really focused on changing a person's performance or improving things, hopefully. Right? Or I've just got content that I need to have in the organization that supports the performance or the things that they need to learn. I'm just choosing to use a multimedia tool to do that. So I don't see, we call all that stuff e-learning, and then we sit in these panel discussions and talk about the state of e-learning. Well, it's because we're looking at e-learning. If I'm a vendor and I build $400,000 e-learning courses, and I only interact with executives who are focused. If an executive's giving me $400,000, he's committed to getting, or she, he's committing to getting a course that has impact, right? If my manager gives me no dollars, they're not making a big commitment, right? <laughs> so when I'm a vendor or I'm an I'm a e-learning person who's building, who's interacting with executives and building these four hundred thousand dollar courses, my idea of e-learning is not the same idea as the person who's got to convert PDFs or PowerPoint files and get them online. But we're not even talking about the same types of products. So. You've got performance-based courses that are focused on action or activity, and then you've got your information-based courses. We call them all e-learning, but they're not all e-learning in the sense of you know, how we might think of it. So I kind of like this type of model better than like a linear one or five, because the implication is one is low, five is high. Here it's like, okay, what are we building? We're building a multimedia performance support. We've got a lot of money and time. Let's build a really engaging, interactive piece. You can look at some of like those news magazine pieces where they can get you to click and all that stuff, right? It's just information, but you're interacting with the information in a different way. Uh, or we have no money, so let's just 
We'll find a simple form-based tool, drop our content in there, hit publish, we're done. Or we're doing a performance support course, but we have no money. What do we do? You know, the course you can build with no money, even if you're focused on performance, is going to be different than the course you can build if you get four hundred thousand dollars. So, something to think about. I was the reason I throw the money out is I was at a uh, uh, on a blog post once I was writing, and um, who's the who's the group that Brandon Hall. The Brandon Hall, you know, they have those awards every year people submit and all that stuff. So I commented once because those things kind of get, they're nice courses when, when you look at them. But they get these awards and all this stuff. And so I made a comment in the blog that I looked at every single one of those courses. They were all over $100,000 to produce. Well, yeah, I had $100,000. I build a pretty decent course, right? But if all my company gives me is Engage and PowerPoint and clip art, what am I going to build, right? I don't even get ten dollars to buy stock images. High school. When I worked at Washington Mutual, they had one photo. This was a that at the time was a multi-billion-dollar company. We were training people all over the country, like thousands of people. I think one of the programs were training fifteen thousand people for this one program. They had one photo of a house that we could use officially. <laughs> so they're spending thousands of dollars, and all these people there, they have one picture of a house that we could use. So I said, I just started the company. I said, this is ridiculous, right? So I went out, back then they didn't have eye stock, so it was Getty Images, buying a single image was about 50 or $60. So I knew they weren't gonna give me like $6,000 to buy images. So what I did is I went and found some placeholder images, I put them in there, built out the course. So we needed to buy maybe 10 images. They ended up, the person who reviewed the courses, saw these placeholder images. They had a big meeting. They brought in this director from this other building. We probably spent like $8,000 in time to argue about whether or not we should have you know spend 80 bucks in images that's just crazy but you know the the thing is and so that really is the challenge right we're not getting we're not getting the stuff that gets highlighted as you know cream of the crop e-learning and you're shown like you go to workshops and it's like this is what you need to build let me show you what good e-learning is yeah i'll build that give me my action script programmers give me a hundred thousand dollars give me all the graphic assets stuff that's what we'll build. But that's really not where most people are at when they're building courses. So kind of figure out where you're in the process. Figure out, are we building an information-based course? Are we building a performance-based course? What type of resources do we have? But if you don't have a lot of resources, um, with performance-based courses and e-learning, a great way is to work with uh, like a blended approach. So one company I worked at, we were training um, project managers, so they were, I always thought it was funny because they were hiring project managers They would, and they were going to like the cream of the crop schools and stuff. So they would bring on the project managers, they needed like six to eight years of education. So they had at a minimum, they had to have a master's and they had to be like, you know, top of the class. <coughs> so they're getting people who probably had spent $100,000 or more in education, right? They were spending all this money getting those people. They're spending all this money training them, giving them access to managing these multi-million dollar projects. And then they contact and said, we need to build e-learning, but they can't be more than 20 minutes. <laughs> so they're wasting yeah. You're hiring somebody, you're requiring them to have at least six years of education. Now you want to train them on a project. They can only have 20 minutes because, you know, that's how important we are, the, the information was. But anyway, so we were working on that. What we did was, the problem they had is they needed to do these live case studies. But they couldn't do the case studies because they had to spend all their time going through the processes <coughs> of managing the project and all these kind of bureaucratic things. So we took all that information, we put them into the world's most boring e-learning courses. They weren't too bad, but they were, they were pretty linear. There's mostly information, a few quizzes just to kind of touch base to see if they kind of got the gist of it. And then they had these learning journals, they could transcribe it. Then when they got to their classroom, 
they could jump right into case study. So they spent an hour kind of rehashing what they should have learned online, and they jumped into case studies and they were able to do that. So in that case, we were able to keep the cost of production way down because we just used the e-learning tools to build like the multimedia performance support. And then we took the action of the performance element of their training and we kept it live in the classroom. But we were able to speed up the time it took to do a lot of that because we took a lot of that content and the information they would discuss and we built it into, into these e-learning modules. And that was a few years ago. Today, now you can do the videos and other things that we didn't have the opportunities to do because of some of the network restrictions. Now today, the technology is making it even easier. You can capture some talking head videos. You can capture better examples. You can build more interactive stuff in there and still keep it at, at a pretty low cost. But you know, you work with the resources you have. You say, are we doing an information-based course or are we doing a performance-based course? On the information-based side, my tip is always do the best course you can do at the cheapest cost and get it out the door. Um, because if it's just information, you know, make sure it's all right and you know the way it needs to be done, but do it at the lowest cost possible. Because you only have so many dollars. You only have so much time. Every course is an equal. If you have performance-based courses and information-based courses, if you can get all your information-based courses done at a lower cost, when you need to commit resources to performance-based courses, you've got those resources. If you have 10 courses to do and you treat them all equal, and let's say five are information-based, five are performance-based, <coughs> The five performance-based courses might take 95% of your time. But if you're treating them all equal, the five information-based courses are going to consume 50% of your time. So now you're lacking 45% of the time to actually do the performance-based courses because they take more time to develop, to build the interactivity, and you know all the stuff you need uh, in the course. So this kind of model is not a bad way to go rather than just linear one through five. Any questions about that? Everybody? working with courses and you know what type of struggles or what are, what are you doing like when you look at the courses you build would you say they're more on the information side or more on the performance side both a range yeah so yes. both or it's a range of them yeah, yeah, yeah. so how, how what like what type of performance based courses would you build uh, for me a lot of it would be um, would be either uh, using a system effectively or sometimes it's having a certain kind of conversation with you know a client, you know, having to and use certain interpersonal skills. Okay. And then the information-based courses, how would that be different? Um, you know, th those are often the ones, yeah, where we don't have as much time as we're getting out there, like what you said, and just trying to make it, you know, a little bit interesting, but there's not a big performance like a new procedure or just something that you need to be aware of or compliance regulation right. stuff. We have a lot of those HR, like we have a new bonus program, here's the bonus program, but we're not really uh, expecting anything, especially not giving you a bonus. <laughs> we're just going to tell you about the bonus program, and then later we'll tell you why you didn't get it. Yeah. Um, we're building like mod various modules, and when we build, you know, it's a clear understanding of which type of module is which, so the ones where we're going to um, actually get them to you know, practice doing stuff. That's that's the that's the meat, and that's going to take a lot more time to build than the ones where they're just yeah. You know, here's here's a series of clicks you're going to follow to do this. Right. Yeah. So that's really you know. And then the thing is to look at what you're doing. If it's an information based thing, get it done at the lowest cost possible. Make it good. Right. Meet your needs. Uh, and then that reserves the resources for your performance-based courses. The, um, you know, I was telling this the other day, but, you know, and it kind of goes to the, even if you're building the same course, the audience needs are different. So I was telling the group, who was in this session the last couple of days? All right, so you're going to hear the story again. <laughs> but the, um, every big company I've worked at, I've had to take those courses on how not to take bribes, right, mm -hmm. those anti-fraud courses. Mm -hmm. And I was joking about how, you know, I really would like a job where I get bribed. <laughs> that, that's what I want. Now, don't give me a course on how not to get bribed. Give me a job where I can get bribed. Let me live the lifestyle for a little bit. Then give me the course to tell me why I shouldn't get bribed. Right? 
But what happens is you take, you know, like the last campaign I worked at, we had people who actually worked overseas where bribery and that type of stuff was common business practice. So as an IT person in a cubicle who was never getting bribed, right, I didn't need, it was a compliance course that was about our ethics policies. I didn't need more, it was an information-based course. I didn't need more than here's the company's policies, here's why it's important, da da da, here's a quick quiz, Coop, you're back to work, right? Now if I went to another country and I'm working with you know these sellers and buyers and all this stuff and bribery was part of the normal culture there and you know the way some some of the, some of the cultures are like that where you kind of got to grease the wheels a little and they don't do things until you bribe them right in that world then you've got to think okay how do I handle that that's not the way we normally do things in the states unless you work for the government <laughs> <laughs> just joking but um, that's not normally the way things work right. Um, Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so at that point, an interactive course where you maybe throw me in some situations, I've got to think through things, I get some feedback, and make the types of decisions I make in the real world. That makes sense. So, same course for one group. It's an information-based course. We need to make you aware of this policy. The other course, it's a performance-based course where you've got to make decisions, and we've got to make sure you understand how to do that. So understanding your audience, understanding the type of course you build is important. <coughs> uh, when you think about rapid e-learning tools and the fact that a lot of this stuff is taken out of your hands with the tools, the kind of three main processes or three main considerations that are going to help you um, get better at building the, the, the courses and managing your resources. So one is the tools. Uh, the tools are getting easier to use. Uh, one of the things that I've found now is, you know, I used to always talk about how you can build these scenarios and things that all you're using is PowerPoint, you can make these interactive scenarios. But what's interesting now is, you know, the tools have gotten easier, like so for example, um, one of the, since I work with Storyline, one of the examples with Storyline, in PowerPoint, I, I, one of the examples I showed at the workshop, um, I took one of the interactive scenarios that Jeanette, who was one of our community managers, she built in PowerPoint. It was a decent, simple scenario. I took that same scenario, it was 20-something slides. You ever have to build anything to hyperlinks in PowerPoint? It gets exponentially worse, right? I mean, you can do all sorts of things, but you really got to manage what you're doing because it's not really designed to build interactive scenarios. But you can do them, and if that's all you had, that's what you did. I can build it, you know, a simple scenario, 26 slides in PowerPoint. I can build the same thing in Storyline, one slide. I was talking to a vendor in London. She was doing a workshop. They built, I don't know, I can't even imagine the time it took them. They built this interactive scenario in PowerPoint. It was something like 900 slides. It was, it was the most amazing thing. Uh, and she had the flow chart. I can't even imagine managing that thing. Then when Storyline came out, they built it 30 slots. So the point there isn't use Storyline, although that is a good point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is your authoring tools are changing. So the authoring tools is selecting the right tool for what you're doing. So if you find you're building a lot of interactive content, the tools have evolved, so maybe PowerPoint-based authoring isn't the right solution, right? So there are other solutions. So understanding your tools, the tools are changing. You've got form-based tools, which are like Engage, you just copy and paste your stuff. And you've got free-form tools where you've got to make a few more decisions about what you're going to do. But you've got different types of tools, different capabilities, so the tools are changing. But the tools are getting easier to use, so that's good. Uh, you've got to have the right access to assets. So hopefully your organization, you know, I would say get in the habit of always requesting a budget. Say, hey, we're going to build this course. You know, you can open up an account with some of those photo sites like iStock and Fotolio. And what are, what's the one that you use a lot, David? ThinkStock. ThinkStock. So you use that. You can buy credits. So you just get used to, you just make that part of the expectation. All right, we're going to build this course. Uh, I'm going to need $100. So we can buy images. That's not too bad, right? Let's say, okay, 
Or you just say, you throw in a bunch of these placeholder images with all those watermarks on them, yeah. and they'll say, well, hopefully they'll say, what's all this stuff? Mm -hmm. If they accept it, then you can say, well, wait a second, we need to buy this stuff. <laughs> but you throw it in there and you say, okay, these are the images we need to buy, right? Yeah. Um, and then you kind of just set the expectation. Or you just say, we need a budget. I need $200 for a budget to, to work on the course. And slowly start to set that expectation. But you need a way to manage the assets, and, and find assets. And then the other side is the instructional design models. And this is the part I think is kind of neat. And I've got a few models that I work with, which I shared uh, the other day. But um, you can pre-build interactivity. You know, and that's one of the things I really like about on Storyline. I can pre-build an interactive element. I can save that as a template. And then I can always reuse it. So you can build simple things like tabs, interactions, or a simple drag and drop. Or you can really think through, maybe there's a scenario structure, like the, um, the broken coworker demo we were looking at earlier. It was like a comic book structure. And then you kind of have panels, still click and read, but panels of information. And then you have a simple quiz question. But it looked like a comic book. Everybody loves that. We get so many people asking about that. But it's a click and read course. It just, people don't see it as a click and read because it looks like a comic book. But you can build that structure. You can build your little instructional design, you know, instructionally sound modules, and then you can save those out as templates. And they're not always going to be perfect, but they're going to be a starting point to help you build more instructionally sound content. So that's one of the nice things with the tools is the templating of not just you know templates for the visuals, but templates for some of the instructional design components, building out pre-building scenario structures and, and things like that. The other thing is think about you know how you're managing your resources if you're managing people. Um, you know I I wrote in Michael Allen's book and I I always say about 75 percent of what you build and what you see in e-learning you could build with a simple rapid e-learning tool. So he said, where did you get that stat? I said, well I made it up. <laughs> but from my experience, most of the e-learning that you see out there, you could build with a rapid offering tool. You don't need a custom flash program. And we actually see, I see, you know, the last six years, I see less custom flash development anyway, because I think organizations have started to see that. So you've got like rapid development, say at the top of the pyramid, you've got custom development. You're not going to do as much custom work, it's going to cost you a lot more money. And then somewhere in the middle, most e-learning is kind of a hybrid, right? You've got some custom stuff, you've got some rapid development, you've got kind of some blended, whatever. You know, some hybrid development. In my last organization, my instruction to the team was, you start with a rapid e-learning tool unless you can prove to me that you need something different. Because we had all these flash programmers and they hate rapid authoring tools because they're Flash people, right? Mm -hmm. I can build this stuff in Flash. I don't need a rapid e-learning tool. The problem, though, was I, I would say, okay, that's fine. And as soon as I needed them, they weren't available because they were working on projects. And I look at their projects. They were building stuff that the rapid e-learning tools were already giving us, like custom video players and, and whatnot, right? So it's like, okay, if you want to do Flash stuff, then we're going to get rid of all the stuff that's taking your time that the rapid e-learning tools can do. Then when we need custom flash development, you're available to do that work. Lo and behold, they all became rapid e-learning developers <laughs> because there was no custom work for that. Um, but if you have to do some custom work, you want to balance your resources right. So let's get information, performance-based courses, if we can get it done with the rapid e-learning tool, maybe we may make some trade-offs. Maybe we don't get the certain type of interactivity, but if we can, if we can meet our goals with rapid e-learning tools, let's do that because that's going to free up our resources. And then most of it's kind of a hybrid development anyway. And then rapid's really not the right word anymore, right? Because the tools have evolved. So I would say they're all e-learning tools or multimedia creation tools, and what was rapid 20 years ago is not rapid today. So they're all e-learning tools. So it's thinking more than about the automated process. Do we have tools that can automate some of our production process? And let's shift as much of the work as we can 
to that where it makes sense. And then when we do need custom development, we do need a programmer, whatever, uh, we've, got, we've got the resources to do that. Otherwise, you're going to end up eating up all your resources, and then when you do need something custom, you know, the, either that person's not available or the money that you had available is not available. Some questions. This is some of the stuff I get a lot. So if you're just getting started, um, with, with this rapid development, what should you focus on? My first tip is good instruction, right? So learn to build um, good e-learning courses. The um, most e-learning courses are probably the result of existing content. So um, what we're doing is we're taking classroom content, which is part of a different instruction mode. And e-learning is not a matter of just taking that and converting it. Unless you work for a school, it's a little different, right? But if you're in a corporate environment and you've been doing instruction uh, in a classroom, it's not just a matter of let's take these PowerPoints, convert them, put some narration on it, and put it online. Not if it's a performance-based expectation. So learn how to build good instruction for e-learning. Um, graphic and visual design, I think, is key. I would even say focus a lot more on the graphic and visual design uh, than the instructional design because they'll at least make your courses look good. Because you may not, you may not hit the mark on the instructional design right away. So at least make them look good. Somebody once said to me, uh, well, you don't want to do that. It's all the, you know, uh, bells and whistles and stuff, right? You're just, you're just dazzling them with the bells and whistles. And so, well, what's the alternative? I've got a bad course. I want a bad looking bad course or a good looking bad course. Well, if all I can do is make it good looking, I want a good looking bad course. Uh, but there is something about the visual appeal of the course too. That's that one stage in the engagement process. But focus on the graphic visual design uh, because it is a mostly visual medium. Um, also then think about the efficiency and production. So that's where we were talking about that earlier today with Storyline. That's where the community comes in handy because a lot of times you don't develop efficiency by yourself. It's connecting with other people who've developed best practices. And so when you work with them or you see what they do, you ask questions, there's somebody else who's come up with something that's efficient. But if, you know, a lot of e-learning people work by themselves, you know, we were talking about that the other day. If I'm a financial analyst, there's somebody behind me or in front of me who's been doing it for 20 more years than I have. And so I could say, hey, back in the days when you guys used paper and pencil. But uh, I can go ask that person about some financial analysis, right, that they may be able to offer some tips or some expertise. But if I'm an e-learning developer, I might be the only person in my company that does e-learn. So where do I go to learn best practices? Where do I go to learn more? So if that's your case, Connect with the community. Connect with people and in, in, connect with, you know, like in the chapters like this or the special interest groups where you're maybe focused on just e-learning or a specific tool. But then you'll learn to become more efficient using the tools, practice, you know, and, and do that. Um, and the better you use the tools, the better your interactivity and stuff's going to be. Because what tends to happen is people who don't really understand the tools they have, they tend to want to go build something interactive, right? Because you go to workshops and just, we need to build interactive e-learning. So you go out there, you've got your tool, you don't really know how to use the tool, so you build this big clunky interactive course. Maybe it was a great idea, but the interactivity just doesn't work, right? And then it's not a good course, but it's a great idea, bad execution. Learn to use the tools, learn to understand what you can do with the tools, and you tend to build better interactive elements uh, in there. And then I would say focus on the reusability. When I build something, you know, I'm right today I just build mostly simple demos for the blog. But when I build something, I'm always thinking, how can I give this away? So I'm always thinking about the reusability, because for me to give it away, I've got to strip out content, make it generic. So I'm always thinking, how can I reuse this or give this away? So when you build stuff, that should always be part of the process. How can I build this in a way that I can reuse it? I don't want to spend all my time building something that's very unique to one thing because then I'm always having to rebuild. But if I'm building like that comic book example that we looked at for those who were uh, here uh, earlier, uh, 
once I understand how that's built, I can build that as a framework and I can keep reusing it. So I'm always building, thinking about the reusability. So whatever it is I'm building, I always think about, can I reuse this? How can I make this into a template? How can I make this easy to use the next time? How can I share this and, and all of that? So always think about that. The big hair. The big hair, yeah. Um, I get questions a lot from managers, like how should I hire people, you know, with the skills, you know, what skills should I look for? Or, or when we're hiring people, what should we do? A few of the things I, I look at when we hire people is are they connected? You know, like if I'm an articulate, if I'm looking for somebody who, who does articulate, you know, because I get a lot of emails for that, I'm going to go to the community and I'm going to hire the people really active in the community because one is, um, like a lot of our MVPs or the superheroes in the community, you know, they know how to do stuff. So I'm going to hire somebody who can demonstrate they know how to do something. I'm more apt to hire that person or somebody who's showing demos or doing screeners. I can see what they do. I understand their expertise. And it's easy to see that, right? It's a lot easier than reading through 100 resumes and trying to figure out if they can or can't do things. What I found a few years ago when I hired back when I at the time I hired David, I ended up getting like about a thousand applicants. And there were a lot of people who seemed qualified on paper. They had no portfolios. And then the handful that I picked to get them to do, I got them to do a practice project. I don't know what they worked on in the past, but their practice projects weren't all that great. So that goes to, you know, if you, if you can see today people who are active, they're in the community, they're doing tutorials, they're sharing things, that's a great way to hire people rather than, you know, I think that what I think is a bad thing is a lot of companies say, we're only going to hire, we've got this instructional design or e-learning development position, oh, and you need a bachelor's degree. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Who learned how to build e-learning courses in their business class, right? I'd rather have you be able to demonstrate to me that you can build something. So I'm going to look for places where you do that. So in the community, if you're connected, because in today's world, it's connecting to the community that's going to give you. You hire one person, you might be hiring 20 people because of the connections they have in the community. Right. So, and that's not too too hard to find. The other thing is really understand your real needs. Do you need a flash programmer? Not honestly, people they. They'll have a listing. This is what we're looking for. And they list every single software application out there. Like, is that what you are you using all those applications? So understand your needs and then hire the person who could do that. Um, look at their portfolio. I would rather see their portfolio than a written resume and their cover letter because that's where you can really see what they do. And then the other thing is, in lieu of the interview, have them do something, right? And then if they can prove it, then interview them. If they can't prove it, don't waste their time and don't waste your time, right? So that if I were hiring people, that's what I would do in lieu of this, the typical, send me your resume, we'll have an HR person screen it. Oh, you don't have a bachelor's degree, you're not even going to be considered. <coughs> oh, you have a master's degree from some school I know, right, in instructional design or education technology, so you must be really talented. Well, they may be, they may not be, but those things don't prove it, right? But this type of stuff does. So their connection to the com to their community, whatever they're doing, uh, their ability to demonstrate that they've done something and, and get them to prove it. Because I had a lot of, what I found, a lot of people who worked with big companies and on big projects, so they'd show me the portfolios. But it's always vague about what they actually did on those projects. So they might have been on that team but you know, a lot of people work by themselves now, so I'm hiring somebody, the expectation is you're gonna work by yourself on all this stuff. And I don't know if you're just a good writer, or if you're just a good visual person, or you're just a good support person, right? So having them actually do something uh, to demonstrate that's important. Yes? I have a question about your portfolio piece. Um, I work in Thailand, and so I have a lot of Everything's proprietary mm -hmm. and it can't be shared. Mm -hmm. And I understand that and you know, certainly don't want to compromise anyone. But I always wonder why uh, people don't just create something. I mean, just, it doesn't even have to be real, um, you know, like a real course for a real client, but just something to articulate. Um, because, you know, the, the G 
generic project is not something we've right. done a lot of. What do you think about creating just mock-ups? Yeah, so that's two good points in there. Um, one is if you're an e-learning person and you want to get a job, then you should develop a portfolio. And you know, I was talking to somebody, I don't know if she's in here today, but I was talking to somebody earlier today. I said, just, you know, you can go online, go to the Red Cross, they've got um, all sorts of information, like CPR, right? Mm -hmm. Take their information, build it for the Red Cross, then email it to them, say, hey, I just built an e-learning course for you, right? And give it to them. If they don't want to use it, that's fine. You can use it in your portfolio, you've got the Red Cross branding and all that stuff. But most likely those nonprofit groups, they'll take the, the free help, right? A lot of government, you can go like the FTC, there's all sorts of consumer training. You can take those brochures, build simple mini modules. Yeah. What I found, we talked about this the first day, here's what happens, if you get laid off, you don't have access to your software anymore, and you don't have access to your projects. So it's in your best interest to always at least, if you can't produce the actual course you worked on because it's proprietary, then um, build something, strip out all the proprietary stuff and build a module um, or build little mini examples. The, um, the other thing about this whole proprietary thing, personally, you know, I've been doing this stuff for a while. If you want a portfolio, you have one. If you don't want to show your work, it's always proprietary. What I find interesting, I was actually going to write a blog post. I probably shouldn't say this because it's being recorded, but I was going to write a blog post about why you shouldn't listen to the experts. Because here's my experience, and I won't mention names, but here's my experience. There are a lot of people who talk to you about what e-learning is and isn't. They never show anything they actually build. And, I've, and I can tell you now, I won't mention names because a lot of people are really well known. I've seen the work a lot of the people build. And I, a lot of times I'll get in these LinkedIn conversations and people will go on these soapbox things. And then I'll ask them, hey, do you do freelance work? You know, can I see something you've done? You know, I've always had people looking for freelancers. Oh, yeah, I do freelance work. Well, can I see what you do? No. Well, you know, it's all proprietary. When you've been doing this for 20 years, you don't have a single example of something you've done. Well, the reason they do that is because they don't want to show you what they've done. Because the reality is in most organizations, they're building linear, click and read, boring courses, right? You might build 800 courses, but you could build the same course 800 times. And so when you want to, sh you don't have anything to really show in the portfolio for all the stuff you want to talk about. But I would say that's a cop out. You know, if you don't have a, if you don't have a portfolio, then you just have lost the opportunity to get a job or you go out and build a portfolio to demonstrate your skills. That's why when I interview people, I have them, I don't care what portfolio they have, it's nice if they show me good stuff, I'm gonna have them build something because I can quickly see um, what they can build. And that's one of the things, one of the things that stood out to me because when I had the job opening, there were a lot of people really well known in the industry who applied and then I saw them actually produce work and I wasn't all that impressed in compared to their signal to noise ratio, right? <laughs> You're going to stand on the soapbox and rant and rave about e-learning. You better have a pretty darn good course to do that. Nobody's expecting you to have a great course, but if you're going to go trash, especially if you're going to go into LinkedIn, grab somebody else's course and trash it, then you better put your own course out there for other people to see, but nobody does that. so. I think, it, personally, I think it's mostly a cop-out, but, you know, if you're in an industry and you want to get jobs, you need to have a portfolio to demonstrate your skills. Well, and it's really easy to do something like that because all the tools companies let you download free for 30 days, mm -hmm. you know? And all you got to do to get another download is have a different email address. I mean, it's easy. Is that the way it works? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, right. I will Let's stop say, the recording. There, <laughs> there a, We've there got a criminal. We've got a criminal tool. here. There's one tool yeah, that at the end of 30 it. days yanks it, and you can't access it at all, publish it. It's just Well, I'm not suggesting yeah. that, but you can always, you can right. always publish, publish your work somehow.
Right. And we even have one guy who has a whole portfolio based on our free templates. So you just find free, he didn't even do anything different. He just took the free templates and put them on his site. He does a lot of Latin. Yeah. A lot of Laura <laughs> But the thing is, I think on the portfolio side, I think that's kind of mostly a cop out, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even if it's true, you know, how are you, you're in a multimedia industry, you've got to have a portfolio to show your work or your capabilities. And if you're hiring contractors and they haven't forked up the money for a license, mm -hmm. For the, the tool, industry tools, they're probably not a very good contractor. Yeah. That would be my. Well, yeah. quote you on that. Are you tweeting that? <laughs> <laughs> I was. Um, no, but I've got a tweet about uh, about uh, uh, license about subscription uh, license. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the the chapter president of the ASTD here in in San Francisco said, "Here's how you get around those licenses." <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just in summary, a few key points. You know, rapid e-learning, I think, is the e-learning industry. Because I don't want is I don't think rapid's the right word anymore. But I think in a big general sense, everything, you know, everything is in, in e-learning. It's all e-learning, and the tools are just getting better. So they're becoming faster to use, you know. Uh, you see fewer people doing flash. I was just talking to somebody the other day and two of his big clients, they went, he was doing all this custom flash work, so he emailed me about getting a license. And um, he said, all my big customers are going to Storyline. That I don't have flash work anymore, so I've got a large Storyline to support you know, their Storyline needs. So, I, and we see that. I don't get nearly as many questions about flash as I got a few years ago. I don't think probably in the last two years I've gotten any questions about flash other than you know, flash player issues. but. Um, so the industry, you know, rapid e-learning is e-learning in the sense that e-learning is e-learning. That rapid e-learning is just now the way, it's, the way it is. And it's not really rapid anymore, right? Because if you get started today, you don't get the benefits of what it was 20 years ago. Now it's not rapid. <laughs> um, and then the thing is, you know, I think the key to your success, one is, you know, understand the tools that you're using, because the better you understand the tools, the, the more successful you're going to be. If you don't understand the tools, you end up building, spend a lot of extra time working on them, and then you build clunky courses. And then, um, you know, understand again the types of courses. Are you doing information-based courses? That's different than a performance-based course, and then um, knowing how to manage your resources. And then, I think from an organization's perspective, especially if you manage people, uh, make the commitment to the resources so that people can be successful building courses. So if you want, if you want good e-learning courses, then there are a lot of bad e-learning courses out there, right? But if you want good e-learning courses, you've got to commit the resources to do that. So you either hire talented people or you commit to training the people you've hired so that they can acquire the skills and experience to build you know, better e-learning courses. And then commit the financial resources for them to build good courses. Any questions? Is that a font? <laughs> that is a font. I love that. That's Shane's hand. It's the best. Shane, Shane Matthews did that. He was one of the blog readers. If you go to my blog, there's just do a search for one on handwritten fonts, and that'll be one you can download. That is really nice. That's awesome. They're also on the e-learning community, the e-learning heroes community. Oh, are they in there too? Oh, I can't remember yeah. If I put those in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're in the community. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, go to the e-learning community and you can find them a lot easier. Was this on my blog? Shane's hand. hand. I like so, who knows to Shane Matthews? I've got mine in there too, but you might not want it. <laughs> There's a reason why I use Shane's and not Tom's hands. <laughs> All right. Any questions so about e-learning? Talk about reusability and things like that, and I discussed it with us earlier today. Uh, do you have any tips on migrating PowerPoints and where there's limitations? I, I think someone asked earlier, but migrating PowerPoint into say like into Storyline or something sure, like that. Probably, okay, yeah. yeah. So if you have my if you have PowerPoint content, um, you know one of my tips, which we, we talked about in one of the workshops, is uh, step away from the PowerPoint content. Mm -hmm. Start with a blank screen. Doesn't matter what tool you're using. Start with a blank screen. Then you want to be intentional about what you're doing. So if you have PowerPoint content, it's just content that's part of your course design. 
Um, but what you build in e-learning for your online delivery might not be uh, what you have in your PowerPoint, especially if a lot of the PowerPoint came from lectures or uh, facilitated conversation. So I first thing is just step away from the PowerPoint, look at your blank screen, look at your PowerPoint as a resource or you know, some of your content, and then determine how you want to design your course. So in that sense, you might be using some of the content in PowerPoint, but you're not necessarily just doing a migration of here's PowerPoint, we're just going to convert it and, and publish. Um, that'd be one thing. There are some things you can do, like say with PowerPoint, uh, on say, like say Storyline, you can import PowerPoint. So David actually had a good blog post. Did that come out last week? Yes. So last week, I think it's in the Articulate's Word of Mouth blog. But he had a good blog post, and this would only be specific to Storyline, but you know, other tools may work in a similar way. But you can build, like I was saying, you can build a drag and drop interaction in Storyline in about 30 seconds, right? So you basically anything you create on that screen can be converted to drag and drop. So the problem, though, is I want my subject matter expert to develop all the content stuff for me, and I want to do the drag and drop then in Storyline. So my subject matter expert has PowerPoint. The person doesn't have Storyline. So you, David's thing in there is like, well, what is a drag and drop? You have something that's draggable, and you typically have a target, so where are you going to drag that to? So you, you build out these PowerPoint templates. They do all their work in PowerPoint. They put all the content and how they want it done in this template. You get it. You import it. You clean it up, and then you can quickly do that conversion to drag and drop. So some, a few different strategies, or I've got 10,000 courses. I was helping somebody not too long ago with that. Got a whole bunch of courses. The client could care less what they look like. They're paying me. I'm just going to take those, publish them, put them online, cash my paycheck. So that's also an option. And like I always tell people, may not be the best option, but I'd rather have money in my wallet <laughs> and go walk down the street and eat at a restaurant <laughs> than be an e-learning guy with a sign holding up, standing on the street corner with no money talking about what e-learning is or isn't, right? <laughs> so there's a place to stand on the soapbox and talk about good e-learning. There's a place to just do the e-learning and get your money. And you can do good e-learning tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but there, there, there's all sorts of options on the PowerPoint side, so it just depends on, on the, what the needs are. Okay. All right. Well, you guys have a great evening. Thank you for having me here. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um,